uh, Jim McMahon, and what I want to go through today is the baptism of Jesus Christ and how it reflects on the Trinity and how so uh, it is also a foreshadowing of what is going to happen to the sons of God later on, all right? So the first thing I want to do, I just want to go ahead and I want to read you the verses from uh, John 131 through uh, 134, okay? And I'll explain to you why John is even doing the baptism, why God sent him to baptize with water, all right? So we're first uh, starting out in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Okay, so there's a lot in those verses right there. Just those four verses that I've just read to you. Okay, it says John came baptizing. Why? So that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could be revealed unto Israel. Okay? And it said, John bear record saying, I saw, a spirit, or saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Now, in the very next verse, it said, the Spirit descending and remaining on him is what's going to reveal that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, okay? Now, this picture here, if you can imagine this, all right, this baptism that John has is the baptism of repentance, and that is repentance from unbelief, so it's a baptism of faith, all right? Now, I'm going to, say, I'm going to tell you what it's picturing of the sons of God later, okay? So, you have the faith of a person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are then baptized in the water, and this is the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ that's washing them clean of their sins. And then you have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, which remains on them. And this is unique to the sons of God. See, in the Old Testament, they could have the Holy Ghost upon them, and the Holy Ghost would be in them. But it was not a permanent thing. Okay, now that doesn't mean that they did not have eternal life in the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, they still had the spirit of God, which is eternal life, which is Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. But it is also Holy Spirit because they have the self same spirit It is the same spirit. But we can't just say that the Holy Ghost is the only one that's God. So it's we're not going to say that the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit. And since that he a person is the only one that's God. See, God the Father, all right, being in charge of the Trinity, he is the highest authority, and it is him that is that spirit. And Jesus Christ said, I live it by my Father. So it is the Father that's in him is why he lives forever, okay? But to say that Jesus Christ is not God would be to say that that spirit is not him either. But it is because he is the eternal son of God. So therefore, that spirit in him is also himself, okay? Now, that spirit is of the Father, but since Jesus Christ is co-eternally God, and he is co-eternally uh, co God, he is also the eternal Son of God. So, if we say that Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God, that would be saying that he is not God. That is what that would be saying. So, if someone says that Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God, then he is not God. Because that spirit has not been in him forever, and it's not also been him, okay? Now, that spirit is the Holy Spirit, but I want to make a distinction here between the person of the Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit itself, okay? So when the Father sends the Holy Spirit out from him, that does not mean that the God the Father is no longer the Holy Spirit because there's no Holy Spirit left, okay? You have God the Father, which is a spirit, and he is the Holy Spirit, and I'm not talking about the person, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit himself, God the Father, his spirit, the portion of him that he sends out, that spirit is a person. So therefore, when we have the Holy Spirit, a person can be sent out from the Father and the Holy Spirit, a person is also Holy Spirit and he is the Holy Spirit. When he's sent out from the Father, just like when Jesus Christ has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit here, that doesn't mean that his spirit prior to this was not holy. Okay. 
Now there is not two holiness, two holinesses, two righteousness, or, or two truths. Okay, there's one truth, there's one spirit, and that spirit is God, and that God is God the Father. So what makes Jesus Christ God is that he is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, and that is because he is a co-eternal person that has the Spirit of God in him because he is an eternal man, and also that Spirit is him, it's never not been him. But, he says, I can do nothing without my Father, all right? And this is because God the Father, it says, God only hath immortality, all right? Now, Jesus Christ has immortality because of the Father, because he is the eternal Son of God, all right? But Jesus Christ was able to die, but God the Father is not able to die, okay? So, when Jesus Christ says, I live by my Father, that is why he is saying that. Jesus Christ was made lower than the angels, so he could suffer death. But God, God the Father, cannot die. And the Holy Spirit did not die. So we know that it was Jesus Christ on that cross that his person died. And the spirit that was in him, because he said, into, my, into thy hands I commend thy spirit. And he was talking about the Father in heaven because the spirit goes back to God. And then the soul of a person that is dead because Jesus Christ died on that cross. His spirit was dead. His spirit died. And he, he himself, the soul, the person, Jesus Christ went to hell. But the Holy Spirit, a person, did not die on that cross. Okay? So I'm kind of making the distinction here so you can see the difference. All right? Now I'm going to get back to the eternal sons of God. All right? Where we have the believer, a person who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he calls upon his name in faith. And when he does that, he is washed in the blood. Okay? Now once that happens, that person is now cleansed from all of their sin, past, present, future, forever. This person is now a saved person. And then they receive the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And the reason I was making this distinction earlier is because I needed to be clear that I'm saying this. That the Old Testament saints did not have the permanent indwelling of the person of the Holy Ghost. But they did have the Holy Spirit of God in them in that they had eternal life. And that God is life. And that life that is in them is the same life that is in Jesus Christ, which is the same life that is the Father. So the Father is life. The Son is also life because He is the eternal Son of God. And that life that is in Him is what is in the believer. And that is the Spirit of God. See, God gives His own immortality to the believer. Because it says God only hath immortality. So a person cannot just live forever. It is God that liveth in them because he is the only one that has immortality, okay? Now, going back to the lineage of the sons of God and what makes us unique is that we have the permanent indwelling of the person of the Holy Ghost. Now, we have the earnest of that inheritance right now, but in eternity, the Holy Ghost is never leaving us, okay? Once we've received the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, he's indwelling us forever, now, when the Holy Spirit, the person, is in Jesus Christ, he calls him the Father, okay? But when the person of the Holy Ghost is in the sons of God that are begotten of the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ, this, the person of the Holy Ghost is called Jesus Christ, okay? So, we know that it is the same Spirit, but when we're talking about the sons of God, there is a lineage here of the person of the Holy Ghost indwelling the permanent Son of God. He's always had the permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Now, we know the Holy Ghost left him at the moment of uh, the moment he became sin on the cross. The person of the Holy Ghost did leave him, all right? But we also know that he's, he's back in him now. But again, we have the fact that Jesus Christ is God, so therefore that spirit in him is himself, and is also the Father, and also the Holy Spirit himself, the person, is also Holy Spirit, and it's the same Holy Spirit, okay? There is no separation there in that way. So when Jesus Christ was telling the thief on the cross, he said, thou shalt be, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, he was talking about the Father in heaven because the Father is God, all right? So therefore, the Spirit of God, God was in heaven, so therefore Jesus Christ can say that you're going to be with me today in paradise, and that is what I think he meant by that. Because the person, of the, the person of Jesus Christ went to hell. Now, also, when he came back up from the grave, when he was resurrected, he said, I had not yet ascended unto my father uh, when he was talking to Mary Magdalene outside the tomb. 
That's why he told her not to touch him because he had not yet ascended back to the Father. All right. Now, getting back just to the sons of God, okay? When I am talking about the uniqueness of the sons of God, I want to, I'm going to use the holy angels as a contrast, okay? We have holy angels which are holy, but it is not their holiness. And what I mean by that is this. It's not of them. It's God's holiness he gave to them, okay? So they are holy spirits, but they are not the holy spirit, a person. Okay, now do they have the Holy Spirit of God in them? Yes, they do, because there is no other holiness. It's God's holiness. But just like a saved believer, now I am, I am a saved person, so therefore I have a Holy Spirit in me, right? That's my personal spirit, but it's not God, meaning that it's my person, but the holiness in that person is not my holiness. It's God's holiness, Okay, and we'll use another reference here. When we're born, Jesus Christ is the light of all men. So when a person is born into the world, they have the light of God in them. They have God in them because they're holy. They're, they don't become, they don't die. Their spirit does not die. They don't need reconciled unto God until they commit sin. And then that spirit dies. Now they need reconciled unto God because the life that is in you, God that is in you when you're born, is a commandment. Life is a commandment. Okay, so we have the word of God in us. That is life. It is the, it is a commandment and we can't keep that commandment. That's why we die. That's why when we reach an age in which God's going to hold us accountable for sin, we die. And then we need reconciled unto God, we need reconciled unto life. And God is life. Okay, that happens to us at the moment of salvation. We are reconciled unto God, which is life. Now, a person that needs salvation, obviously their spirit is dead after they have sinned. Their spirit is dead, so they need reconciled unto God. That is why we get saved. But going again, I, I kind of went on a digression here. I want to get back to the baptism of Christ and how this is actually showing his eternal sonship. Okay, and as I've, as I've already said to you, with the sons of God, people that are saved, the unique thing about the sons of God is they have the indwelling, the permanent indwelling of the person of the Holy Ghost. Now, that permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost is a part of what shows us to be sons of God. We have the Spirit of God in us, the person of the Holy Ghost that is Jesus Christ. So therefore, now Jesus Christ having the permanent, the eternal sonship, this baptism is actually showing to us in real time something that existed in eternity already forever. Okay, Because God is perfect. And what I mean by that is he is whole, he is perfect in and of himself. So if we have a father in eternity, we also have the son in eternity, the loving son of God that walks in his spirit, that walks in love of the father. He also has something that is the father's portion, and that is the inheritance. And that inheritance is the Holy Ghost, the person of the Holy Ghost. Now, obviously, he has the spirit of God in him himself. And since these things are not mutually exclusive, he has both of these things, the spirit in him that is himself and also the Holy Ghost that is in him, the person that is of the Father, which is the inheritance of the sons of God. Now, this is the inheritance and, and this is the Holy Ghost in power. OK, now, obviously, uh, this may seem a little confusing because these ideas are not mutually exclusive. What I mean is they overlap. All right. So in eternity, Jesus Christ has always been the eternal son of God. So he's always had this inheritance. So I can't see into eternity and understand that. But God has played it out in real time at the baptism of Jesus Christ. And, and what he does here on earth is showing him to be the son of God. Since we can't see that, he has actually played it out on this earth to show that this is the son of God. This is what the son of God is. This is who the son of God is. This is what the son of God would be it, you know, if it had to play out in, in, in 3D reality plus time, okay? But this is just something that already existed in eternity. So what he did was real, what, what he did actually happened, but it is also at the same time symbolic of something that existed in eternity. That is what I'm trying to get across here. And I know I had to go through a lot of things to, to explain this, but if you go back through and to try and just to understand the Trinity and try to understand the nature of God, then this, I believe, at the, at the baptism of Christ really just gives us the whole thing. 
You know, we have the authority of the Father. He's commanding the Holy Ghost to indwell Jesus Christ. You know, he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All right? And it says, without faith, no one can please Him. And Jesus Christ said, I do always those things which please Him. So therefore, we have the eternal, the eternal Sonship there in reference. And what I mean by that is this, that Jesus Christ said, I do always those things which please Him. And when you're talking about an eternal person, and when he says always, that is something that's analog. That is something that exists from end to end, from everlasting to everlasting. So when people say, well, Jesus Christ could have sinned, well, that, then what his statement was, it, I don't believe that's even possible. Right? I don't think it's possible that Jesus Christ could have sinned. Now, obviously, I believe he could be tempted in this flesh to sin. That is not the same thing as being able to actually sin. Okay? I don't think that it was possible for him to sin, just like I don't believe it's possible for God to lie. So, therefore, you know, this is, again, just relating back to the eternal sonship. And I think where people get the problem with, where they have the issue with, is they're trying to use something that's digital, and they're trying to uh, put it together to describe something that's analog. Okay, And what I mean by that is this. Digital was finite. We have finite points of time and moments of time here in space and this vector, and I'm not going to get into deep into that, in, in, in the vector of space-time. But these things are finite. Now, when you add all the building blocks together of everything, right, it does not equal the sum of the whole because God is infinite. And when I say by analog, you know, that we're going to use analog in the reference of literally from everlasting to everlasting, not just a continuous wave within a moment of time, but a continuous wave that literally exists forever, all right? And there are other ways to use this exact idea it's to, to symbolically describe things in the Bible, you know. And the reason that is, is because the Word of God framed the world. So therefore, all truth within this world can be described by the Word of God, you know. So therefore, we can use these things to, to help us to understand them. But they're in the Word of God. Excuse me, they're in the Word of God itself. So we don't need to just come up with our own understandings. But there are things in here, like parables that Jesus Christ uses, that are, have finite usage. They're limited usage, which means they're used to describe one aspect of something. But when you take them all the way to fruition, they're not going to work out because we have the, the digital and the analog. So when those things, they don't overlap in that they have complete utility in description. So you can't take the analog parable, or excuse me, the digital parable to describe something that's, that's analog. But the whole word of God itself, the mind of Christ, is able to be described in and of itself. So we don't have to take the digital and apply it to the, to the spiritual. We don't have to take the, the, the carnal things and apply them to the spiritual thing to understand that. But there are symbolically representative things that are within the creation itself that are truths that can, can be described by the Word of God or describe something in the Word of God if they are truths, okay? And I think I, think I described that correctly here, and I, it may have been a little confusing, uh, but I would say go back and watch this video again and go through the verses that I gave you and, and look at these things so that you might have an understanding of what I am saying. And pray to God that He might help you to understand it. Because it, it, is, it is deeper, this is a deeper understanding, and it is a little more difficult to understand. Whenever you're, whenever you're going from uh, uh, the fleshly or carnal understanding, the digital, uh, uh, to, tr to try to understand the analog, that it, it is very difficult. But the Bible actually does it itself, in that it is spirit, it is analog, and it's describing analog. So it is describing itself, but it's actually using representations in the digital to describe points and parts of it. But it in and of itself is continuous. So therefore it is able to describe itself completely. It is the measurement stick. So whenever the word of God, since it framed the world, it is able to measure or to judge everything. And we're not just talking about physically, but we're also talking about spiritually in like, as in God weighs the hearts. All right, and we're talking about the spirit here. All right, so I think I went through everything I possibly could go through in a short video. I will go through different things in other videos that are a little more extensive that will help people to understand 
what it is that the Word of God is saying, what it is that I'm trying to, to get across point by point. And I thank you very much for listening. And if you like the video, share the video. Have a God-blessed day.